Around 2.8 million years ago, our ancestors, the Homo habilis, were using the first stone tools. And since they were predecessors of primates, I think it's safe to say that they were walking and climbing around barefooted. So for all intents and purposes, we can pretty much consider that dirt was the first climbing shoe to ever exist in the world. However, since then, shoes, but more specifically climbing shoes, have evolved greatly. New materials, designs, and innovations has allowed us to go from this to this. My name's Albert Oak, and this is a history of climbing shoes. The shoes in rock climbing have evolved hand in hand with the evolution of the sport. The first shoes that were used to climb mountains, but more rather steeply hike mountains, were heavy leather boots. The upper on these boots were completely made out of leather, but not only that, the soles were also made of leather. In this photo of John Muir, one of America's earliest mountaineers, was wearing one of these leather boots. If anything, they resembled the shape of a modern dress shoe. In 1844, Charles Goodyear received his first patent for vulcanized rubber, which started the trend to make soles out of rubber. And shortly after, Hiram Hutchinson bought the rights to the patent and started to create one of the first commercially sold rubber bond boots. His brand, which still exists today, was Eigel. In 1880, John Blakey wanted to improve the longevity of his boots and hammered protective pieces of metal into the sides and soles of his boots. These were known as Blakey's or hobnails and looked like these. The spikes would give the boots better life and more traction on hard terrain. You can see how modern day crampons evolved from this invention. Often accredited as the father of rock climbing in the British Isles, W.P. Haskett Smith climbed the Knaves Needles in 1886 and did so in a leather boot and most likely used the hobnails to give more traction while doing so. As this is one of the only pictures I could find, you can see that some of the members in the photo has spikes in their shoes. Although there is no current documentation, it's likely the others would have done so as well while climbing. In 1900, Oscar Eckenstein introduced the world to bouldering. And in this photo, you can see what might have been one of the first bouldering shoes in the world. A common trend with all the footwear until 1930s were heavy leather boots with hobnails or metal cleats hammered in. But in 1937, Vitaly Bramani created the Karamata, or tank tread rubber lug sole, in partnership with Pirelli tires. This was the first time true rubber innovation was introduced to the mountaineering world. This company would be known as Vibram, and in 1954, the first successful ascent of the summit of K2 would be done using boots with Vibram soles. You can see Lino Leccidelli wearing the heavy boots in this photo. Around the same time that innovations in mountaineering boots were being made, Pierre Alain, a French alpinist, really enjoyed bouldering, and thus created the first climbing shoe that began to shape modern climbing footwear. These shoes were called the PAs, and were a lace design made of canvas and had a rigid sole. In 1968, Edmond Bourdonneau would purchase Pierre's company and create rock climbing shoes called the Super Graton. Although the sole is quite thick for today's standards, these were considered softer and more versatile, especially for bouldering and Fontainebleau. The Super Graton was by far one of the most memorable shoes during the early days of pure rock climbing. Their catalog boasted that it would provide support, control, and was sticky. A few years later, two big players would enter the rock climbing shoe world in 1979. Jesus Garcia Lopez from Spain would create one of the stickiest shoes on the market at the time. The Boreal Fire. Here you can see John Bacar on the classic V8 Midnight Lightning. Climbers like Ben Moon, Yuji Hirayama, Wolfgang Gulich, and Lynn Hill would all be seen wearing these shoes. Soon after, one of Italy's oldest mountaineering companies, La Sportiva, would enter the scene and create their own line of climbing shoes, and be competition to Boreal. La Sportiva would have their own slipper called the Ballerina in 1984, which resembled the titular footwear. Didier Rabatou, yes, the father of Olympian Brooke Rabatou, can be seen climbing in the slipper in Verdun. There are two primary ways to make climbing shoes, board lasted and slip lasted. Up until now, all climbing shoes were built on a board last type construction. 
In simple terms, the sole of the shoe would be placed on a last, the foot shape mold, and the upper part of the shoe would be placed on afterwards. This creates a much stiffer product, and the midsole, the part that gives your shoe its stiffness, didn't have much room for customization. With a slip lasted construction, the process is inverted. The upper would be created first, slipped over a last, then the midsole and sole would be placed on afterwards. This would allow specific placements of the midsole and control the flexibility of the shoe in its final product form. If you're ever curious if your shoe was constructed on a board or slip last, for the most part you can find out by looking inside. If there's stitching in the inside, there's a good chance that it was built on a slip lasted construction. And in 1985, Boreal would release their Ninja. And this was the first slip lasted shoe to ever hit the climbing market. This slipper would have an elastic portion to hold the foot in place, and this design still exists in modern shoes today. With the slip lasted construction, they were able to control the flexibility of the shoe and the area you need it the most. From here on out, the design of climbing shoes would heavily revolve around the slipper design. During the same year, Charles Cole would introduce the world to Stealth Rubber and name the shoe the 510 and his company 510 after, at the time, what was considered the hardest climbs in the world. At the 1988 Snowbird Utah World's first international climbing competition on an artificial wall, a lot of what the competitors were wearing had the same lace boot style design. The shoes focused on great edging ability, but not much attention was paid to the heel cup. This wouldn't change until the La Sportiva Mythos. First released in 1991, its shape and design has remained mostly unchanged. La Sportiva ran the laces around the heel to give more stability to the heel and added a rand to the shoe. This is a rubber strip that you can find on a lot of climbing shoes today, which added another layer of stability. These innovations to the heel cup were the direct result of climbers climbing more difficult climbs and needing more technical heel hooks and precision. As climbing evolved, shoes evolved. The colors of climbing shoes during this time were typically what you would find in 80s and early 90s fashion, and the construction of climbing shoes were moving mainly towards a slip lasted style. You can see this picture of a catalog featuring La Sportiva shoes including the Kendo, Mary Asher, Mega, Ballerina, and the Futura, a shoe that has evolved greatly but still exists today. At the end of the 80s, Vibram would release its Vibram Grip Rubber, a rubber series popular on climbing shoes even till this day. New brands in the 90s began to emerge. In 1992, Rock Pillars, now Otsun, released their first shoe. Andrea Boldrini released his shoes in 1993. In 96, Stefan Golowax and Uwe Hofstadter were listening to Red Hot Chili Peppers in the garage and were spontaneously inspired to start their own climbing shoe line, aka Red Chili. In 1997, Jose Luis found Tanaya. As a lot of new competitors entered the market, designs and materials were constantly pushed to improve friction, technicality, and life of the shoes. In the late 1990s, La Sportiva released their Mira, which was an extremely downturned and asymmetric shoe. Its edging ability and power redirection to the toe box was unlike any other and would soon push La Sportiva as one of the forerunners in the climbing shoe market. The 2000s gave birth to a few more new brands such as Mad Rock in 2002 and Evolve in 2003. Velcro straps were gaining some serious popularity from the mid 2000s and onwards. Many shoes opted for double and sometimes triple Velcro closure systems, such as the Mad Rock Hooker EZ. In 2007, La Sportiva created another shoe that would be a staple in the climbing world, especially for the competition climbing. As its name suggests, the La Sportiva solution was advertised as exactly that. A solution to all of your problems. The rounded heel cup gave more stability to technical heel hooks, and the single strap system allowed more surface area to toe hook with. Two skills that are extremely important in competition climbing. 510 responded with a shoe designed by Dave Graham and the first person to do V15, Fred Nicole. The Dragon. The rubber was extremely thin and soft. This thin and soft shoe echoes what will soon to come in the climbing industry. In the early 2010s, La Sportiva releases its shoe with Tommy Caldwell's name attached to it, the TC Pro. And Evolve comes out with the Shaman, a shoe with Chris Sharma's name attached to it around the same time. The TC Pro would be used widely on outdoor big wall projects and crack climbing. 
while the shaman would be seen on hard sport climbs, boulders, and even competitions. So far we've talked about most major brands, but there's one major brand we haven't mentioned much during all of this, and that's Scarpa. But more importantly, we can't even begin talking about Scarpa without talking about Heinz Mariacher. Heinz is a shoe designer that started at La Sportiva designing his name brand shoe, the Mariacher, and also the ballerina mantra and revolutionizing heel mythos. The edging monster in the Mira, the quick slipper the Cobra, and put heavy design input in the Miracle Shoe Solution. The extremely technical testerosas and also the katanas were designed by Mariacher. However, after he left La Sportiva, Scarpa hired him and took the market by storm. One of his first shoes from the Scarpa line was the Techno, which used his idea of lacing the heel for better support, followed by the Mago, a similar shoe to his Testarossa but with subtle design changes. Heinz also spearheaded the Instinct line, a line of shoes that today has versatility across the board for any type of climber and style of climber. They have slipper, lace, soft, stiff, low volume, high volume, and every other variation of the shoe in between. Among the Instinct, he also designed the Vapor V and Booster. If there's anything to say about this guy, he knows how to design shoes and design them well. Almost all of his shoe designs are still used today all around the world. One of the more exciting developments in the climbing world was the popularity of climbing gyms, and a section of shoes a lot of climbers don't think about too much are rental shoes. Rental shoes would be designed with thicker and harder rubber soles for the longevity of the shoe. Almost all major companies would join the trend and make their own rental shoes. Companies would opt for using proprietary brands of rubber to keep costs low. With more gyms, there was also a demand created for the entry-level shoe. The La Sportiva Tarantulace, Scarpa Origin, and other entry-level shoes brought in more climbers. This category of shoes was a very much needed category since it expanded the climbing population and allowed entry-level climbers to develop their skill and footwork while giving good longevity to the shoes while keeping the price relatively low. This category of shoes is arguably the most important category, as it brings in new climbers and makes them permanent long-term climbers. On the opposite end of the spectrum, at the top level of competition for several years, the 510 Dragon initially dominated the pro scene since its soft structure. Soon then, replaced by the high angle, on the opposite end of the spectrum at the top level of competition, the 510 Dragon initially dominated the pro scene for several years. Its soft structure and high sensitivity made it a popular choice, but was soon then replaced by the 510 High Angle and the 510 Team series. But one of the most popular shoe to be in the pro scene even today was the La Sportiva Solution. Its versatility across the board made it a great choice for comp climbers alike. But comp climbing changed heavily in the last 5 years as it moved towards a more volume heavy style. Heinz Mariacher again made another great shoe called the Scarpa Drago, which gradually has become more and more popular on the World Cup scene. A softer shoe does better on volumes and bigger holds, but with Heinz's design, the Drago did well even on competition slab. The Drago has only been out for about 2-3 to three years, which brings us to now. Although the global pandemic has slowed down the climbing industry, we're in a position where huge waves have been made throughout the climbing industry, especially when it comes to shoes. Black Diamond recently has entered the climbing shoe market. La Sportiva came out with their entire competition-specific line, including an updated comp solution that's softer and more precise in theory, which is designed to be great for smearing, and their 4.99 speed shoe, the first speed climbing-specific shoe to be made. Scarpa is coming out with new versions of the Instinct and a low-volume version of the Drago to get an even more catered specific fit for those who need it. 510 have been working on a pro version of their updated high angle which is geared towards indoor comp climbing as well as they have been updating their coveted dragon, even making a velcro version. The old designer for 510 actually moved on to create his own company, Unparalleled, and recently signed to Mo Narasaki. Evolve recently came out with their Phantom, which was made in collaboration with Daniel Woods and Paul Robinson. And the 1980s company Rock Pillar, which is now Otsun, recently signed Kaira Kondi and are making big strides to be a forerunner in the climbing industry again. With companies like Mad Rock having several athletes that wear their shoes in the Olympics, the competition is steep, which only means better shoes for consumers. We're now seeing soft slipper single strap velcro designs more and more popular, 
and lace shoes becoming less popular. The rise of indoor climbing has definitely impacted the way our climbing shoes have been designed. Before, if you wanted to start rock climbing, you would do just that. You'd go outside and start rock climbing, so shoes were stiff, and even entry-level shoes were stiff. But with so many gyms opening in the last few years, a new category of shoe is emerging, the soft entry-level shoe. Scarpa's Veloce is one of the first shoes to allow beginner climbers who start off in a gym develop their footwork around the volume and big holds setting style of the modern gym. I've mentioned in a past episode of Beta Break how Evolve and We Are Brain Dead are collaborating to give back to the climbing community, an initiative that I hope and I think we'll be seeing more in the future. There are currently over a dozen climbing brands and companies that are making climbing shoes currently today. I've compiled a list of the ones that I can find, but I'm sure there are plenty of other climbing brands that I've missed, and if I have, make sure to mention them in the comments below. So what's in the future of rock climbing shoes? Well, I think with the 2021 Olympics happening, there's going to be a huge surge of popularity in climbing. Major brands possibly will be more interested in developing their own climbing shoe lines as well as investing or buying out climbing shoe brands that already exist. We've seen Adidas buy out 510 and they've implemented the PrimeNet technology in their Alien shoe, which is the proprietary technology that only Adidas had at the time. We can see other companies such as Tom's partnering with Sewell recently and they've been able to create great initiatives with that project as well. New technologies and new materials are only going to make climbing shoes better, and I'm so excited to see what's going to happen. Now, I want to leave you with this. I was a climber that climbed in rental shoes for almost a year, and then I climbed in the tarantula laces for almost a year as well afterwards. I went from that to climbing in this, the Furia Air, one of the lightest and most versatile shoes that I've ever climbed in. But when I look back and think to myself and remember the times that I had, even wearing those rental shoes, I had an amazing time. The same amount of fun that I had climbing in those shoes, I have in these shoes. I don't think it really matters whether you're wearing rental shoes or the Furia Air or anything in between. What matters is that you're having fun and you're climbing because that's what really matters. And, of course, as always, keep crushing it. Hi everybody, thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Leave a comment down below about a, your, one of your favorite shoes or one of the first shoes you've ever had and what made it so memorable. There are a wide range of topics that I wasn't able to cover in this video, so feel free to start a discussion in the comment section below. I want to preemptively thank all of you for 20,000 subscribers and this is an amazing milestone to me and I am so happy and excited about it. Thanks for all the support and as always, keep crushing it.